right, OK, I know it doesn't seem like it, but I've just decided this is the last talk I'm ever doing because it makes me too nervous. And I've been thinking about it since yesterday. I feel quite ill. Um, I've put Wendy Lawrence's sculptural journey because I suppose it is, in a sense. Um, I started ceramics on a foundation course um, well, yeah, many moons ago, I was 24, I'm 52, now you work out the maths. Um, and I really thought I would do graphics and illustration, and um, I went into the 3D slot, kicking and screaming, not wanting to do any of that at all, thank you very much, not interested in 3D, and um, picked up a piece of clay, and, and the rest is history. It's I've absolutely um, fell in love with the material, and I'm still in love with it. So it's a sculptural journey, um, really about sort of um, my sort of shared journey with all the other makers and friends that I've made over the years so I hope it's um, interesting. Um, I'd like to keep it as informal as possible if you don't mind so if you've got any questions just shout. Uh, we won't do Q&A at the end because it's that's way too formal. Um, so this is my workshop because I think as makers we're all sort of interested in terms of um, where people make you know. Um, and it's a cutie place, it's a, a tiny house, but um, one of my workshoppers is here actually today in the front row. Hello, Naomi. Um, so this is my uh, workshop in my gallery space. And uh, really, I suppose the ceramic journey I've been on has been um, a mixture of, of my own practice, industry, because I, I worked for a tile company in Denby in North Wales, where I'm from. Um, for 16 years, uh, making huge ceramic wall murals and swimming pools. Uh, and I also teach. So my own work, I guess a lot of you will probably know. Um, I really started work with um, things like this, troughs, um, that then sort of proceeded on to sort of uh, making different things. So some things I make are literally solid pieces of clay um, and others are slab built. So I'm going to do this sort of talk and demo at the same time for some reason. And I know it said a brief talk, but it's actually not. So never mind anyway. Uh, so yeah, standing stones that actually did come from stone originally. Uh, it was anything to do with stone. And, and really now, I suppose it's um, absolutely anything to do with um, natural form and texture in its entirety. Um, CPA, uh, that was a Cal show uh, in 2019. The last one, I think, wasn't it? Um, which, yeah, carting round heavy pieces of ceramics with granite blocks on the base. Really wise. <laughs> uh, Naomi. <laughs> um, I also do workshops as well. So I think as a maker, um, if you're able to just make and earn a living, wow, good on you. Um, I, I think that's not so easy. So um, it's, it's great to do a combination, I think. Um, I wouldn't like to make sort of 100% of the time. Um, I wouldn't like to teach 100% of the time. So it's um, a very nice combination. And I also like um, sharing the knowledge that I've gained over the years as well, uh, most of the time. Um, teaching, I, I, I do sort of really right across from um, Littleys um, to Ancients. <laughs> Um, it's just great fun. It doesn't really matter what the age, you know. Ceramics is open to everybody, isn't it? Um, so schools and things like that I do as well. And um, Rithing Craft Centre, which is uh, on my doorstep up in North Wales. And I've also done um, collaborative projects in the past. So certainly the, uh, the murals and things that you see here. So these are out in uh, Abu Dhabi. Um, so I suppose in a way, it's worth me putting this in because my work... Um, became bigger because I was doing pools and underpasses and making my own work at the same time and um, I suppose because the pools and underpasses were so big um, the pieces of work that I was making didn't feel big to me they felt quite small so the sort of it's changing the other sort of direction now as I'm getting older and they're getting heavier and the, the discs are getting smaller because I can't pick them up <laughs> Um, so, yeah, so um, Craig Bragty, where, I mean, uh, incredible, really, in a way, because um, I learned so much about um, carving clay, about different textures, um, about glazes, about glaze application. So, you know, when you're doing something like that on a full-time basis for 16 years, you, you, you're gaining a lot of knowledge. So I still make um, murals occasionally, and... 
this was a commission for um, a couple that um, yeah wanted a mural basically. Um, so it's it's nice just to sort of keep your hand in. You're not sort of doing the same thing all the time. So um, it's yeah, it's good to do. Um, I also worked with a friend who was actually on the foundation course at the time that um, I was studying, and uh, she's an architect. So I, I, I quite like that sort of crossover um, of, of, of different areas. And she runs a sort of um, ecolab, which is um, architecture and ceramics, really. So um, we produced a show together with um, several makers um, used, making these really huge sort of sculptural pieces, but they were modular. So the largest was sort of so big, but then um, it became... Um, these really big pieces of work, so um, that's one of them. It's, it's the idea of putting modular pieces together to make something rather large. Is, uh, is you know, it's an interesting way of working. So this was the the, the knuckles that I, I sort of put together in the hope that I think there's about seventy pieces in total. And um, yeah, as I say, it, it was about in the end about four meters by three meters, a uh, massive thing. And I'd sort of thought. I hope this works, because I've made them all individually anyway. It did do, and it was, uh, it was interesting. So, as I said, the inspiration for my work is, is derived really from, um, from natural form, from texture, uh, and from architecture. Um, I live very close to Anglesey, um, which is very inspirational. Um, I've always loved standing stones, so I've, I've got a gazetteer, so I, I kind of like travelling around the country when I can do and, and finding new stones. And also um, finding um, inspiration from travels. This was um, up a river system in, in Borneo. And um, I think as a, as a maker, um, if somebody had said to me, oh, you're going to do ceramics and then you're going to be able to travel around the world and, and go and stay in different places with other ceramic makers and do symposiums, I'd have laughed and said, no, nobody's going to be that lucky in life. And it's, uh, it did happen. So, yeah, look at me. Um, so I take lots of photographs um, that I hope you will sort of understand where um, the textures and the surfaces and things come from in terms of, of my own work. Um, I was showing this to Michelle Young-Hairs earlier, actually, and, and she said, I thought that was a piece of your work. And I went, thanks very much. <laughs> um, but it's, it's all these different surfaces and... and, and it's really, I suppose, in a sense, I just love carving clay. Um, and it doesn't, you know, you, you can sort of think about the, 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 the micro and the macro. The, the next slide, this slide, um, the, the first image is um, a river system uh, flying over Siberia. Um, and the other is a, some, called the flower caves in, in Israel. So um, it's just incredible, really, the, the, the surfaces and, te and textures that you can... Fine. So I've I've built up this um, big library really of, of imagery, but it's it's kind of nice to show people um, where the ideas come from. So this image um, was actually uh, in in Australia, and everybody was watching the surfers on Bondi Beach, and um, I'd got my back to the water, and I was I was just taking photograph after photograph of this amazing sandstone. And I've, I've used this time and time again on, on pieces of work. Um, I also use architecture, as I said. I, I find, you know, modern buildings, well, not always modern, but Gaudi. I mean, who doesn't like Gaudi? But curves and forms and things that you can sort of develop quite simple forms in themselves that become um, quite busy, I suppose, in terms of texture. Um, but I like the combination of that simple form and, um, and the sort of heavily textured surface. And, of course, going back to what we were talking about before, which uh, are the standing stones. Um, I've yet to go to Callanish on the Isle of Lewis, but uh, it'll happen one day, I'm sure. Um, but it's, it's all, you know, things that I find inspiring, uh, certainly um, in our country, but, you know, and, and travels abroad. Um, this is the biggie for me, the, the, the global community, um, which is just the, the amount of wonderful um, makers and friends that um, I've been lucky to meet and, and yeah, do call friends. They're, they're wonderful. So that is actually me up the um, pole in the um, tent in um, Millsbeck in the Netherlands. <laughs> so lots of fun, lots of parties. Um, and I'm also one of the directors now of the International Ceramics Festival um, with 
lots of silly things that you can do with, uh, with ceramics and clay. Um, and I've also been very lucky um, to have travelled around um, you know, and, and been to symposiums and um, stayed with some wonderful makers. It really is a global community. Um, here we're mixing um, clay and donkey dung. <laughs> Hours of fun. <laughs> and of course, you know, here we are, festivals and shows. And I, and I think certainly in the last 12 months, it's been, um, you know, we've not really done hardly any shows and it's been absolutely horrendous. I can't tell you, the, I think Celebrating Ceramics was the first show I did this year. And, and um, there was quite a few of us in tears because we were so thrilled to see one another and be out, you know, it's, uh, it really is that community, it's so special. Um, and also being invited to go out to different places. This was um, a show out in Spain, um, which I'll never go on a ferry again. I spent 24 of the 28 hours on the bunk because I couldn't move. I think that was a Bay of Biscay. It was hideous. Um, so I'll always drive that next. Um, but we, we try and bring something to, uh, to that community in terms of um, all the things that we made on here were all out, made out of clay and slip but we did this sort of big sort of table of goodies that uh, everybody took home. Uh, but it's, it's lovely to be involved in things like that and, you know, and making, uh, you know, meeting other makers and, and, and sharing that sort of um, that cultural diversity, which, again, is, is, is a, a, an absolute honour and a privilege, really. Um, this was a symposium out in Borneo. And it came from somebody that I met years ago on a, um, a Turkish symposium, and she was out there teaching. So people get all over the place, don't they? Um, so it was a real ceramic trip, um, meeting makers and um, yeah, having a wonderful, wonderful time. And lots of residencies that I've, I've been lucky to do uh, in various places. And I think that's a really important aspect of, of, of making because... Um, we, as you know, we all have to juggle our lives and it's not easy to sort of just be able to focus entirely on, on making your own work. And it can be quite frustrating sometimes because you just sort of want to hide in the workshop and, you know, have the next idea come to life. And it doesn't work like that, you know, we juggle lots of different things around. So residences and being able to have, you know, um, a, a couple of months somewhere, I know it's amazing, but it's, it's really useful because you can really pile your head into your work rather than thinking about paying the bills and taking the dogs out. Um, yeah, quite important. Um, I'm going to do a demo in a minute. I was going to do it both at the same time, but I don't think I can do that. I'm not multitasking. Um, but making is by far for me the... the, the the best bit. Um, I think there are three. I think there are three types of maker. I think you've got your makers, your glazers, and your firers. I'm definitely a maker, and I know that the, the glazing is in a really important aspect um, to my work. But um, God, I find it boring. <laughs> It's creating something, making something out of clay is, is is to me far more exciting than slapping glaze all over it. And don't let people fool you that, you know, if, if um, you, people sort of think, oh, you, you, you must be a, a really a, a good chemist to be able to, uh, um, you know, put, uh, apply glazes to your work and understand glazes. And I, it's an experiment that you, you just have to sort of be um, open to ideas and experimentation and not to sort of think, I don't do that, just go for it. Um, so I will go through yeah, glazing naive the exclamation mark for a reason because uh, it's not my most fun thing. Um, I mixed a pile of glazes up uh, last week and it was just everywhere. It, I can't glaze tidily. It's just all over the garden, all over the workshop. It's horrible, anyway. Um, yeah, uh, glaze. And it, it just takes forever. Um, I am going to go through that in a minute in terms of um, glaze application and uh, raw materials and silicon carbide. And I've got a piece here um, to show you. Um, so uh, essentially, your um, stop that. Uh, the silicon carbide um, and found a pound for every time I've mentioned this. Um, the silicon carbide creates a gas in the glaze and that creates the bubbles and the blisters. So I add the silicon carbide to most of the glazes I use, but not all. So the glazes, I've, I've got between 10 and 15 different glazes that um, I multi-layer onto the surface with a brush. Um, but 
I also go over the top of the glazes with raw materials. Um, I also use oxides and, and really build up that surface. So some areas of the pieces of work will be very, very thickly glazed and other areas won't be. So you can really play about with the surfaces. Um, firing, uh, I work also, I teach at um, Glyndor University um, as well as running my own workshops um, and, you know, um, invited sort of um, lecturing. Um, so I'm in the lucky position of everybody says, oh, you must have a really big kiln, and I don't actually, but Glyndor University does, so very handy that. Um, also, once I've finished firing, um, I have a, a water-fed uh, grinder, which um, has diamond pads on it, so I can actually um, grind back the surface, because sometimes uh, it can be a little bit abrasive. Um, so I use sometimes I use a Dremel with a silicon carbide tip because it's really strong material, and sometimes this uh, water fed grinder just to soften the surface. So it's um, a lengthy process, but worth it. So as I said, um, I started off with um, trough forms, um, and then my work sort of developed from there really. And I, and I think um, I, I, I enjoy that experimentation. Uh, I don't want to make the same sort of um, the same things all the time, and sometimes you have to because you've got to get out to shows, and you you sort of think, yeah, I know, but I th the disc piece I know is going to sell because it's a disc, you know, and it's it's easy. People um, have more of it. I don't know. I think it's people sort of um, tend to be drawn to things like that rather than the asymmetrical pieces of work that I enjoy making more. But you know, you've got to do a little bit of both. Um, but the troughs then developed into um, actually making troughs and then adding um, clay to it, which I'll, I'll go through in a minute uh, in terms of other making methods. Um, sometimes I make um, vases. I mean, these are, these are older pieces now, but uh, with very, very thick coils. So everything I make is on the thick side, not on the thin side, because uh, the point of it is it's essentially um, a three-dimensional canvas that you're using um, to carve back into it. So it's, a, it's you know, simple form, but, but, but very, very thick. And then you've got all those different, I'll explain in a minute, you've got all those different levels to, um, to play with, really. Um, stop it. Uh, yeah, it's sometimes, I think it's, it's great to have that variety in, in, in life and, and be able to make what you want. It's... Uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's exciting. Um, and it's, I think it's just all the things that we make. I mean, you, you get used to making, um, having done this for the past X amount of years. I don't know, 28 years, something like that. Um, and it is, it's experimentation and seeing what sort of, uh, what surfaces work and what surfaces don't. Um, this piece was actually um, a, a disc that uh, I was making at Rhythm Craft Centre and it fell over. And um, I thought, so, oh, and it's it's surprising actually what you can, you know, happy accidents are happy accidents, um, and I, and I think it's okay to be honest about that, you know, um, and just playing about with 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 different methods um, and different materials. This is actually quite a low fired piece of work. Um, where I, I use like um, on gobs, which is like a, a glaze slip almost, very, very dry glaze. Um, so there's no silicon carbide in it. Obviously, there is on these two. Um, and, and, you know, sometimes I do less carving than others. And, and you know, these ones, you know, have a very sort of um, fan coral um, type of a shape. And I guess... I guess it's come from the, the love of sort of um, natural form and texture, but also the 16 years in, in Craig Bragdy drawing coral pools. <laughs> it's got to come out somehow, hasn't it? And, the, of course, the, the pitted pieces, which I will go through in a minute, um, you know, that was really from all the sandstone um, and also rocks and things that I've, I've collected over the years that I, I still use. Um, that I still find inspiring. And the interesting thing with silicon carbide, the, the um, copper pinks that you see here, um, the, because it actually does create um, a gas uh, in the glaze, 
Um, I fire in electric kilns. I don't fire in gas kilns. Uh, they're just electric kilns. Um, but because of the gas, uh, I do get copper pinks sometimes. And sometimes I don't find them until I grind back afterwards. So, you know, that's quite sort of, yeah. I was going to say Christmas come early, but I don't really like Christmas, so we'll think of something else. Um, but yeah, it's it's I can't control it, but sometimes you know that's that's the, the the fun of it's in the lap of the kiln gods, isn't it? But you know those textural pieces that um, sometimes you get very lost in in, in making work, and and it's just. Um, an adventure that, that you I, I get to making a piece of work and I get to the end of it and, and think oh <laughs> I did that <laughs> you sort of get lost in it um, and yeah again standing pieces um, so that's pretty much it really in terms of um, what my life's been about in, in terms of making and teaching and, and having a jolly nice time with friends thank you very much and um, I'm not so sure about keeping it in the back of my van, but, you know, we've got to keep costs down, haven't we? So I'm going to get rid of that for now. And then uh, I'm just going to go through um, some making methods uh, and, and, and how I carve. Um, so before I go any further, I had to nick clay because I forgot to bring my clay. It's a bit stupid, really, but there we are. Uh, so Hannah kindly gave me some clay. So... Um, it's really squidgy, um, which isn't a bad thing uh, because I don't use it like this at all. This is just, uh, no thanks. It does absolutely nothing for me. Uh, but if it's getting to this, I mean, come up and, and just feel the consistency after because I, it's, it's really quite hard. And that I don't like playing with, but that I do. So, and I know you, you have to have it um, in some ways, but... If, uh, let me just explain this first. So, for instance, if I'm making trough forms, it's, it's about that form. And um, what I don't like is, is that, that very flat sort of surface. So I use um, lead dressing tools um, that you can get on eBay for 20 quid. And then everybody goes out of here or wherever I'm doing a demo and they go like, off to uh, eBay to find the lead dressing tools. But these are wonderful things because you've got those, those lovely curves that you can use to just bash clay. So um, what I don't like is, that, as I say, that flat base. So what I tend to do is start to change that base. This is really soft. I'll move on to some other clay in a minute. But what's great about it is the fact that as soon as you do that, you've already picked it up. So it's not sitting flat. You've got something that's got a little bit more bounce and a little bit more height. Um, it stops it just feeling um, like it's a squat piece of work. So essentially, I get so far with something like this and then literally start to carve into it. So I, I do use lots of tools that I can literally just... make marks into it so I don't know what that is I think it's like a, a breeze block type thing but anything makes anything makes marks in clay but as I say you know you can really sort of sit things back up once I've got so far with that as I have with this one um, then I'll literally use my loop tools just to carve back into it And if I'm really honest about it, what I would do with this is go like, that's grim, I'm going for a cup of tea and I'll get back to that in a couple of days. So I never normally have like um, one piece of work on the go. I have several so that um, I can, they're all in different stages of, of, of moisture, you know. So that I'd leave alone and then let it dry out a little bit and then start adding um, the, the clay when it's got a little bit drier. But for, for this sort of today we'll just deal with the soggy stuff so sometimes I'll leave a trough at that stage I might just um, carve back into it a little bit more but then you'd end up with something like this once I've done the troughs but I want to add to it um, I use coils so that obviously you'd have to do when it's still soft 
but I don't do round coils and that, as I said everything's sort of um, on the thick it's, nothing's um, nothing's thin don't like thin because it's a it's a three dimensional canvas that you want to carve so that's essentially uh, my coil <laughs> each one to their own isn't it uh, forgot my fork, so I, I, Naomi's been laughing now. She's going, she tells us never ever to use a knife to do scoring, but I forgot my fork. I forgot everything this weekend, actually. Luckily, not my sleeping bag. But yeah, I, I forgot my plates down, so I had to nick these concrete blocks for my sister who lives up the road, luckily. So that's all a bit silly. Anyway, so scory, scory. Um, and scory, scory. No, I'm not going to do that, you know the score. So, then, if I'm going to add the coils, if I'm joining coil, uh, um, coils, I pinch, and then I pinch the other way. Vital this, because clay has a memory, so you can alleviate that memory, and that ain't coming apart. So, um, I've started actually making a piece of work um, not dissimilar to this, which is now up here. So it's it's quite um, it's quite I suppose narrow at the bottom. And it's starting to get bigger and bigger, and it's quite heavy. But God, it's great fun. Um, but what what's great about this and the, the idea of being able to make a solid piece and then join coils onto the solid piece is the fact that what you've got is a very very strong form on the base. Because you're not starting with a coil on the bottom and then adding all those coils, you know, because it, I think it's, it doesn't give you um, scope for a good form, but that does. So you've got a strength in that that you could just stop and say, oh, it's, it's um, you know, literally a, a trough form. You stop at that or you add your coils, okay? And then that can become anything, you know, and... and and I, that's the fun in this, in terms of being able to um, make something that's really quite asymmetric and, and really thick, that you can just go to town and carve to your heart's content, basically, can't you? So that's, that's trough forms. And then... Yeah, we're done on soggy clay, aren't we? Can I have that back? Um, So slab built pieces. Um, again, this is um, this is quite thin, but it's it's a sm it's a much smaller piece, so you're all right with that. Um, I use uh, cardboard tubes and things like that. I, I just literally get a curve on the piece. This is a little bit soft, but whatever. You get the general idea, don't you? Um, so you've got it's way too soft, actually. But Whatever. So you've um, a lot of the standing pieces that I've got here today uh, are literally just a larger version of this, that uh, and it's two slabs um, placed together. And then of course, what I do with that is cut down each side, because if I don't, you've you've not got anything to join it to. So that's quite important, just to make sure that you've got enough to be able to join it. I wish I remembered my fork. Anyway, you get the idea, don't you? Talk amongst yourselves. Uh, definitely, the more heavily grogged it is, the better. Uh, partly because I I, I, um, I make quite big pieces, so uh, you know, a more heavily grogged clay is going to be stronger than a smooth clay. And, and don't say porcelain to me because I think it's a swear word. <laughs> uh, each one's their own, isn't it? But it's it's not what I like doing. But anyway, so you, you you get the idea of uh, of scoring, blah blah blah. And I don't use slip ever. Uh, what I do use is um, a spray gun and literally just 
spray just in the area that I've pretend I've done that better than I have because I haven't got a fork so we'll have to deal with that and then I can join those together so it's it really is a means to an end what I tend to do as well is use my thumb to press the piece of work together because that ain't coming apart So, hmm? well, um, going back to what we were talking about um, in terms of clay consistency, um, very often I have to stop my students and, and, um, from actually wetting all the clay down all the time because everybody thinks that you need to be working with wet clay. Um, and what happens is, of course, you've got something that's really soggy that won't stand up because you've just you know, shoved uh, water and slip and stuff all over it. And it just, um, it's very, very difficult to try and build forms if you do that. So um, what you're doing with a bit of water and, um, and scoring it is creating slip anyway. So I don't need to sort of splash slip all over it. And I think also you, you get used to different making methods in terms of, I, can, I never um, wedge my clay. Um, it's very heavily grogged. I've never had any issues with it, but you... Excuse me, I think you start to um, get rid of all the processes that you think, I don't really like doing that. I'm not going to do it. You know? so it's, and I think that's important. If, you, if, you, if you're making all your life, you want to do something that you enjoy, not something that you think... You know? So, I mean, generally, with the glazing thing, thank goodness for audio books. <laughs> Otherwise, God, I'd be fed up. So, yeah, it's important. It's that consistency that's so vital. Um, because what you don't want to do is try and carve clay when it's too soggy like this. Have a go with this when you come up here, maybe in a minute. So you, you know that's not gonna uh, that's not gonna fall apart. I'll leave that as it is because you can you get the general gist. Cause here's one I made earlier. Do you know I did that in a school recently. Everyone went. Nobody knew what I meant. <laughs> God, I'm showing my age now, aren't I? <laughs> so again, um, this. Lovely bashy tool. It's my favourite bit, this. Uh, you can use to make sure that you join your piece of work. So, uh, and I don't worry about um, pieces of work that I sort of think, oh, that's going to come apart. Because by the time I've finished bashing the merry hell out of it, it's not going to. Not a chance. But what you've got is all that, uh, that wonderful thickness of, of, of clay. Um, Ow, that's my finger. Uh, that you can just literally play with. So this, these are, I think, probably about as thick as that. So you've you've got, you know, over an inch at least. If if I do that, if you leave that, you can carve all of this, which I'm going to do in a minute. Um, so you might have simple form like that, or you decide that you want to use your tool so that you can do something that's quite asymmetrical like so and you can it's a three dimensional form so we'll head for the three dimensional form but you can start to connect those curves and marks and generally get carried away I'll come back to that in a minute as well. So the other thing that I use as well for um, cleaning up forms, uh, surf forms, fantastic things. So that if you've got something that's really um, a bit scruffy to say the least, you can literally use your surf form to clean up the surface. Good job I've got this because I forgot my kidney as well. Don't know what I was thinking. Then I forgot my cloths. It all went a bit wrong. <laughs> Can't think of everything, can you? So you can really clean up the surface and the edges. Uh, 
and we'll give it a nice sharp edge here. sharp edge there. I don't know why on earth Naomi came in. How many times have you seen this now? <laughs> Is it? Anyway, so you get the general gist. So um, if it's a simple form like this, and yeah, admittedly, I would be cleaning this up, but I don't want to bore the pants off you all. Um, Excuse me! <laughs> oh, that's bad. I think I could do a better job myself. <laughs> I won't. Ooh. Ooh. I'm going to apologise for them. I'm sorry about that. Anyway, so stop it, please. We're busy in here. Um, so uh, what I do is tend to think about the form that I'm using um, to try and follow the curves or the points of the form, okay? So, trouble now, not a dirty mess. Um, and then back to the wonderful loop tools that you can then start to divide and subdivide. Oh, this is the best bit. So at the moment you've got literally just one area, but you can start to divide those a little bit more. So I might take out this area. Leave this area in. Take out this area. What's great about this clay as well, if, um, if you're reclaiming this clay, it goes straight back in the bag. Pop a little bit of water in, job done. No wedging. Get rid of all the horrible jobs that we don't want to do. Life's too short, isn't it? So, you can carve. What I tend to do as well, you can see I'm using a tool on an angle. Um, you don't need to eat back into all of that. So, it sort of... Um, Almost, in a way, you're not taking off as much as it looks like you are, but you've got all that clay to play with. And I forgot my brush as well, honestly. And then I'll take this out. Again, on an angle, because we don't need to take it all out. So you can start to divide and then subdivide. Also, there's a three-dimensional scruffy form. Um, you've got all that to be able to eat back into at the side, just to make it more prominent. It's two things. One, that you put in textures in there because I like carving. Um, and the other is that you're also providing a key uh, for the glaze. So those areas that you can fill with glaze, um, you'll get thicker areas that you get those really thick bubbles in. You'll see if you want to come back to the stand after and if you've got any questions or whatever, just give me a yell or if I've completely bored the pants off here, I won't see you again. Um, and the same here, so that you, you're starting to think about creating different levels. You know, so you might do something like this. Or you might not. You might do something like this. Oh, I wasn't joking when I said it was a nice thick piece of clay. 
what's great about it as well is if you go through, it doesn't matter, you can just shove a bit of clay back in there. I always thought that it, I'd quite like to do stone carving, but I think I'll be really rubbish at it because I do go through quite a bit and I just pick a piece of clay or put it back in. So that's um, one method. If I've been working on these things, um, I try and follow the form so that I can start to really carve back where I've used the um, bashy tool, technical term, you know. But again, you can eat back into that so that what you're doing is creating lots and lots of different levels. So that's the sort of, that's the fun of it. So I, I end up whittling away in my studio. Um, and then it, it's sort of, um, the piece of work started off massive and uh, ends up being absolutely tiny. And then I've got a workshop floor full of clay. <laughs> Don't ask me. It is what it is. So I just make a mess, basically. Um last but not least, uh, disc pieces. If I'm doing a disc piece, um, I tend to do the circle. You can see here, it's slightly, um, it's slightly bigger than the actual circle itself. That's where the circle would be, and I've left the clay on. So what I'd do is shape that down into this bottom this bottom bit it, so it's not a true circle because um if i actually took that off it would look like it was punctured okay because you'd have to take that off so you've got a punctured disc which doesn't look right so it's not a true circle you've just got that slightly longer bit at the bottom but it stands better because it's all about form isn't it um but once i've done that i'm just going to show you what i do with um with these pieces so I can go right the way through the centre because this is one solid piece and it's kind of nice to work in different ways you know rather than sort of um, working in the same way all the time um, I think I'd get fed up it is though it's a discovery isn't it you know because you I mean let's face it you can do anything with clay amazing stuff so what I tend to do is take off that inner edge so that you're starting to make that surface look slightly more interesting because it's it's tapered that a little bit more. Yes, I agree. Um, so it's not just flat. So I take that off first and then I use all these different tools here. carve back so it's about um, variety of scale um, so you're not doing uh, all the same size because that makes it look more natural because it wouldn't all be the same scale um, but also it's eating back into it so that you're eating back into it on different angles not just straight down you're going through the sides and then turning the piece of work around and making sure you sort of go back and back and back so it's, it's just it's um, it's quite repetitive but I kind of like that Sometimes as well, you know, you can um, you can add. Sometimes I use the, the, the bits. Um, then I just literally just smush onto the surface so that you can actually build up layers. You know, it doesn't all have to be entirely a uh, flat piece of work, depending on what you want to do. You can change things around. But you can just do exactly what you want, can't you? So it's th that variety of scale... You'll get that when you see this in a minute, that you can just literally keep carving back into and then change the scale slightly. What I tend to do is leave the outside edges because um, it gives a piece of work strength. Um, yes, that's a <laughs> trial and error, isn't it? That you sort of think, oh, right. And that's a piece that's actually two halves, but sometimes it can be interesting. <laughs> I, uh, I now use um, kiln bricks, heavies, um, when I'm firing work, because um, 
I've done that before now, and I've, I've, I think I showed you that image, didn't I, of all the, the pieces of work in the kiln, just all sort of nice domino effect, which is exactly what it did. And uh, one piece just went, and just went, doo -doo -doo -doo, and took out, oh, I don't know, um, 15, 20 pieces of work, and it was just before Cal. So I'd gone from audio books, I'd gone from um, Harry Potter book one, right the way through to Harry Potter book seven, made all this work, and then the da -da 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 -da. <laughs> so I went back to Harry Potter book one <laughs> and did a bit of a groundhog day, to say the least. It happens, doesn't it? So I think it, I think, um, it makes us quite grounded, doesn't it? Or totally insane, I'm not quite sure. Maybe it's a combination of both. So go smaller again. And then you start eating back into these the pieces and then you keep going you keep going you keep going and then you do the other side eventually I'm not going to do that now um, I also um, people um, tend to ask about the um, rods as well and it's just one loop tool that I use to literally push into the piece of work I'll show you in a second with that. So that um, the pieces that I make for outside um, can can have a rod that goes, um, I'll show you again in a sec, um, into the piece of work through the granite block and then into the ground. So if you've got silly doggies like I have running around your garden or it's very windy as it is in North Wales, you know, it's okay. And of course they're frost-proof because um, I fire to around 12.40, um, 12.50. So um, they're all right outside. It's a good job, really, because I've got a tiny house and uh, I like making big work, so it does sit in the garden. So that, that becomes that in a minute. I'll pick it up in a sec. Um, or, again, it's about dividing and subdividing, which I did on this one anyway, but just to give you an idea of sort of um, how you sort of um, plan where you're going to carve. I use these for doing um, demonstrations on my weekend workshop, so um, it's, it's good, actually, because I've sort of had this ready, which is like, oh, just take those down, that'll be all right. So that then becomes this little monkey, which this is, a, this is the fun of it. Um, sometimes the fun of it, sometimes not, depending on um, how the kiln opens. Um, but yeah, when you, when you, you get those uh, the, the belters out, that most of the time when I open a kiln, I sort of think, yeah. um, I'm not I'm not keen. It's like, mm. and then I have to sort of take everything out and then try and um, look at them individually because I think when you open a kiln, you know, it's just a massive stuff that you've made and it's. I can I have to just sort of uh, get used to a piece of work, and some sometimes there there are pieces of work that I just don't like at all, and they get flung to one side, and then I've got the pieces that are, you know they're okay, and then occasionally I, I get the pieces that I thought I think you know that they're a good piece, and I'm quite pleased with it, and they stay uh, until I've made something else, and then that becomes discarded as well, really. So you, you just I think you just can't like every piece you've, you've, you've made forever, you know, it's that, uh, that idea development, I suppose, as a maker that, you know, that's, that's kind of what we do, but um, just to sort of, so we've got the, I can't get the pin out now, figures, doesn't it? I think I really bashed that in there, didn't I? Well, I was just there trying to get the pin out. How would you place that in the kiln? Are you standing it upright? Um... It depends. Very often, if, if it's a bisque firing, obviously, you know, um, I can lay them down. Um, but in terms of a gloss firing, I can't. But what's, what's, I'm feeling lucky because, um, because I use silicon carbide, um, I can stand these in the kiln. If I'm not sure about them, if they sort of feel a little bit sort of wobbly, I can just place um, a heavy just next to the piece of work to stop it falling over. Um, and then I can just literally knock them off and, and, and clean up 
um, the, the glaze area with um, with a Dremel or the Waterford grinder. Because I'm applying um, a lot of glaze and because the surface is quite um, open in a sense because of all the bubbles and the blisters, uh, it's not like a really glossy glaze that you just wouldn't be able to hide. So lucky me. <laughs> so the, the granite blocks um literally you know if, if it's if it's indoors then obviously um i just have a pin that just sits up into the piece of work but if it's for outside then i have a longer pin so that goes down into the ground you'll notice with the, the bigger pieces outside um so yeah as i said you know you you, you sort of produce um you produce um, pieces of work that <laughs> are heavy enough anyway, then you stick a granite block on the bottom. Completely bonkers. <laughs> and that's it, basically. Um, and that's the last talk I'm ever going to do, so I hope it wasn't too, um, too boring. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, if you have got any questions, please go ahead or if you want to come up and just uh, I mean I would do that if you're thinking of making things like this you know just come and feel the clay consistency because it's it's a there's a massive difference between carving wet clay and carving at least leather hard clay because that's what you should be carving it makes a big difference so none of this squidgy Ugh.